Hello, I'm Eric Strong from Strong Medicine, and in this episode of Underappreciated Diseases, I'm discussing the Erlos Danlos syndromes, also known as EDS. First, what are they? The Erlos Danlos syndromes are a collection of related genetic diseases caused by defects in the structure or function of collagen or other components of the extracellular matrix, characterized by various musculoskeletal, skin, and soft tissue manifestations. What does EDS look like? Well, when I was in medical school, pretty much the only thing I learned about EDS was that it was a genetic disease that causes extreme flexibility and that there was an increased risk of a heart valve disorder called mitral valve prolapse. The impression students were left with was that it was a relatively homogeneous disorder that was more of a curiosity than a serious medical problem. No discussion about chronic pain and no discussion about additional organ involvement. And that was a really horrific misrepresentation of a serious medical condition whose manifestations are far more diverse, which is why it is part of this series on underappreciated diseases. The first thing to know about EDS's clinical presentation is that there is no one typical clinical presentation. This is partly because what is often referred to as Erlos Danlos syndrome is actually, as mentioned a second ago, a collection of clinically and genetically distinct diseases, which is why it's best to refer to EDS as Erlos Danlos syndromes in the plural. EDS has gone through multiple classification systems. The most recent created 13 subtypes corresponding to mutations in one or more specific genes. The frequency of these subtypes are not equally distributed. For example, the hypermobile subtype is by far the most common, comprising more cases than the other 12 put together. It's thought to have a prevalence of about 1 in 10,000, give or take a factor of 2. Classical and vascular EDS are next in apparent frequency, and the others are quite rare, with some subtypes having been diagnosed in fewer than 100 individuals in the entire world. This is probably not the final classification system either, because medical science is continuing to discover new aspects of EDS. For example, there may be more clinical subtypes waiting to be pulled under the EDS umbrella. Also, the gene or genes responsible for the hypermobile subtype has not yet been discovered, and when the mechanism is finally described, that may shake up the classification system too. Despite the significant clinical and genetic diversity within EDS, there are symptoms that are relatively common across the syndromes. These include joint hypermobility, recurrent subluxations and dislocations, premature arthritis, skin hyperextensibility, easy bruising, poor wound healing, including abnormal scarring, various ophthalmologic complications, various forms of autonomic dysfunction, and chronic pain. In addition to these relatively common symptoms, there are a few important life-threatening complications that are overall rare, but are central characteristics in vascular EDS. These are arterial rupture, which may be either preceded by an aneurysm or be totally spontaneous, spontaneous intestinal rupture, and peripartum uterine rupture, which is a very significant cause of maternal mortality in that population. I want to spend just a moment on one other fascinating facet of EDS that probably deserves a video of its own, at least at some point. In the last decade or so, there has been an observation that three seemingly distinct pathologies appear to coexist more frequently than would be the case from chance alone. Hypermobile EDS, dysautonomia, particularly POTS, and a condition called mast cell activation syndrome. Given that we still haven't identified the molecular pathogenesis of hypermobile EDS, there's speculation that it could involve some relatively novel mechanism that links these three things together in a way that we do not currently understand. Or alternatively, the appearance of an apparent connection could be an illusion due to a combination of chance, cognitive bias, and imperfect diagnostic criteria for each. We, we just don't know yet. I'll include some links about this interesting question in the video description. Now, what about diagnosis? EDS is primarily a clinical diagnosis, meaning one based on the history and, in particular, the physical exam, in some cases supported by genetic testing. As just said, the most common subtype of EDS, hypermobile, doesn't have an established specific genetic abnormality, but the other subtypes more or less do. And I say more or less because 
there are individuals who appear to have all the clinical signs and symptoms of a particular subtype, but do not test positive for the gene abnormality that causes the subtype. Many of these individuals probably do have EDS, but have genetic mutations that haven't been discovered or characterized yet. Each of the subtypes has its own set of diagnostic criteria. Now, it's too much to go through all 13, but I will summarize the three most common. This will be modestly simplified from the formal definition, but a diagnosis of hypermobile EDS requires three criteria to be met. First is generalized joint hypermobility as determined by something called the Baten score. The Baten score looks at five specific joints. Can the fifth MCP joint be passively dorsiflexed beyond 90 degrees? Can the thumb be passively moved to touch the forearm? Do the elbows hyperextend beyond 10 degrees? Do the knees hyperextend beyond 10 degrees? And can the individual with legs extended bend forward enough to be able to rest the palms of their hands flat on the floor? Individuals get one point per side for the first four maneuvers and one point for the final one for a maximum score of nine. In order to fulfill criteria one, the score an individual needs is age dependent due to the fact that joint range of motion decreases with age. At least six out of nine is necessary if prepubertal, at least five if between puberty and the age of 50, and at least four above the age of 50. For criteria two, the patient needs to have at least two of the following three features. Feature A, five or more systemic manifestations of a generalized connective tissue disorder. Feature B, a family history of hypermobile EDS in a first degree relative and feature C, musculoskeletal complications such as chronic pain and recurrent joint dislocations. And criteria three, the person must have both an absence of skin fragility, which would suggest a different EDS subtype, and an exclusion of other connective tissue disorders and alternative diagnoses that also cause joint hypermobility, such as Marfan syndrome. For classical EDS, there are two major criteria skin hyperextensibility and atrophic scarring, and generalized joint hypermobility, and a list of minor criteria. A provisional clinical diagnosis can be given if the person has skin hyperextensibility and either generalized joint hypermobility or at least three of the minor criteria. But a definitive diagnosis can only be given if there is molecular confirmation via genetic testing. While hypermobile and classical EDS can look similar to one another, vascular EDS looks quite a bit different, and that's reflected in its diagnostic criteria. There are five major criteria, a family history of vascular EDS, arterial rupture at a young age, often given as less than 40, spontaneous sigmoid colon rupture, uterine rupture in the third trimester, and the spontaneous formation of a fistula between the carotid artery and something called the cavernous sinus, which is a venous structure in the brain that's located behind the eyes. And there is a long list of minor criteria, which are mostly physical exam findings. What's confusing about the so-called criteria for vascular EDS is that they don't seem to be treated so much as criteria as they are features. For example, unlike hypermobile EDS, which has a very specific set number and combination of characteristics, to receive a diagnosis, vascular EDS is a little bit more nebulous. The 2017 International Classification System of Ehlers-Danlos Syndromes states that the diagnosis is suggested in the presence of at least one major criteria and some unspecified number of minor criteria, but the wording in the document also seems to elevate spontaneous pneumothorax to the status of a major criteria without explicitly making it a major criteria. As with classical EDS, the diagnosis is considered confirmed with genetic testing. And that brings us to the differential diagnosis. That is, in a patient presenting with what looks to be EDS, what other conditions should we be considering? First and foremost, because of the overlapping features, one needs to consider all of the EDS subtypes. So for a patient in whom a diagnosis of hypermobile EDS is at the top of the differential, Classical EDS is probably number two on that list, and vice versa. 
Other diagnoses to consider include something called a hypermobility spectrum disorder, which, like EDS, isn't a single disease entity, but rather a collection of conditions that share similar characteristics, but which can still be clinically distinguished from one another. They present with some of the same hypermobility findings, particularly as HEDS, but generally speaking, without the non-musculoskeletal findings. Marfan syndrome is a genetic disease of connective tissue characterized by joint hypermobility, tall, thin stature, and an increased risk of mitral valve prolapse and aortic aneurysm. And fibromyalgia is a disease of poorly understood pathogenesis resulting in chronic, diffuse musculoskeletal pain, hypersensitivity to touch, fatigue, depression, and poor sleep. Regarding diagnosis, it's relatively common to hear from patients with EDS that they spent years or even decades being labeled as having one or more alternative diagnoses or without any diagnosis at all. Some are told that they are just unusually flexible and that the pain and other symptoms they experience are unrelated or exaggerated or even psychosomatic. Other patients with EDS are mislabeled as having conditions like ANA negative lupus or chronic fatigue syndrome. This happens partly because the hypermobile subtype lacks a definitive objective test. Also, the disease's manifestations are multi-system. They don't clearly fall into one individual specialty, but instead cause problems that might simultaneously fall into rheumatology, derm, optho, cardiology, GI, or neurology. You know, like the classic parable of the blind men and the elephant, if you only observe one part of the whole, you can misunderstand what's in front of you. That's not to criticize those specialties, it can be a challenging diagnosis to make. Also, as mentioned in the beginning, medical training of healthcare professionals does a poor job of conveying the diversity and seriousness of the disease. All of this results in EDS being under-recognized and under-diagnosed. In the internet age, it's not uncommon for patients themselves to be the first to realize their probable diagnosis. At the same time, there is anecdotally a recent phenomenon of people self-diagnosing EDS and either never confirming it with a physician or rejecting a physician's assessment that they, in fact, do not have EDS. It does not mean that such patients don't have an important medical condition, and some of them may nevertheless actually have EDS because the diagnostic criteria that we currently use is imperfect. However, for some individuals who have self-diagnosed EDS, their condition falls outside of what's currently considered to be the ehrlos danlos syndromes. Now, there are two big problems with this. First, these patients lose the opportunity to have their actual diagnosis made, whether it's EDS or something else, which prevents them from getting the most effective treatment for their particular problem. And second, when some, you know, not, not all, but when some physicians see patients who they believe to have misdiagnosed themselves with EDS, it feeds into EDS being pejoratively labeled a trendy diagnosis, which diminishes its perceived seriousness, ultimately hurting everyone. Physicians may not consider EDS, even when the diagnosis is suggested by the patient, because the physicians have been biased to think that patients with apparent self-diagnosis of EDS are always wrong. Now, this is a huge problem for a population of patients who already often feel marginalized and not believed. With more research, hopefully we'll develop a more complete understanding of the genetics and pathogenesis, particularly of hypermobile EDS, and once an easy and reliable test exists, this will no longer be an issue. As genetic diseases, the ehrlos danlos syndromes have no cure, but there are many components to their successful management. The most important is a referral to an EDS specialist. Unfortunately, because it's a relatively rare and underappreciated condition, EDS specialists are not available in many places. Another key aspect is patient education, which includes genetic counseling. Patients with EDS require a multidisciplinary approach to pain management, which includes a focus on low-impact joint-sparing activities, such as swimming, cognitive behavioral therapy, and pain medication. Special attention needs to be given to wound care. Wound dehiscence is a significant problem in EDS, as is unusual scar formation. 
and patients need regular monitoring for complications. What this monitoring looks like depends on the subtype, but it may include periodic echocardiograms, eye exams, dental exams, and periodic evaluation for the development of scoliosis or other spinal conditions. Last, let's discuss prognosis. All EDS subtypes are chronic, lifelong illnesses that confer risk of chronic pain and disability. This does not mean that everyone with EDS will have the same outcome. If not already clear, the experience of living with EDS is extremely variable. The specific prognosis is highly dependent upon the subtype. Life expectancy in hypermobile and classic EDS is normal, while the median age of death in vascular EDS is unfortunately about 50 years. That's it for this brief introduction to the Erlos Danlos syndromes. I'll have some links to additional resources in the video description. If you found this video interesting and helpful, please consider subscribing to Strong Medicine and checking out other videos in this series on underappreciated diseases.